Testing, testing, one, two, three. Good morning, fancy meat computers. How's everybody doing today? I hope you're all doing well. On this fine Tuesday morning. Excellent. All right. So, um... There don't appear to be any announcements. Um, aside from, I'm gonna I'm gonna change things up a little. So, contrary to the um, contrary to the deployment order of slides as expressed in the Avenue uh, topic listing, uh, I'm gonna I think I'm going to do topic three next after we're done topic one. There's been a uh, reasonably large contingent of people who are asking tons and tons of questions about Linux and Git, uh, considering this is going to be expected um, for, uh, you know, assignment submission and stuff. So I thought we would just, you know, get that out of the way, and then we'll go on to the, uh, go on to the C stuff. You got so much sleep, your fancy meat processor is running on all cylinders. Excellent! Um, so. So this is, um... So we were in the middle of talking about how one goes about compiling a C program. Uh, just... I know, what? He's starting it. He's starting on time today? What the heck? Yeah, maybe this will be encouragement for people to show up on time. Um, so, just to review, the processing, uh, the, the, um, compilation process requires you to edit your C file, you then feed it into the compiler, which performs pre-processing, parsing, assembly, and linking, and then, uh, when you actually execute the program, it is first loaded into memory and then executed. So, ha! Ha! So, well, thank you. I try to be entertaining. So, um, so we were talking about syntax errors. Of course, uh, something like forgetting a semicolon constitutes a syntax error. 
In contrast to Python, which will not tell you that you have an error until it encounters it unless your program is unparsable, um, in C, you have to get past this, you have to get past the, uh, the parser and the type checker before any kind of executable is produced. Nothing will be executed unless everything can be compiled. So there you go. Um, rather, so not everything is a, is an error though. Um, you also have warnings, which should in theory be a, um, a new thing. So, so we will do topic one, topic three, then topic two. We're not skipping topic two. We're going to come back to it because it's also very important. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like YouTube as a, uh, as a medium for this, but anyway, so compiler warnings. So when you are compiling a, um, oh my goodness. Uh, do I have... There we go. All right. So when you compile your, like, hello.c, get it, hello.c, open my editor. There we go. So if I do something silly, which say, uh, like, say, if, x, uh, if uh, 1 is equal to, you know, x is equal to 3, 4, um you know, printf, whatever. Uh, int x is equal to three, right? This is incorrect, right? Under other languages, this would be a syntax error uh, because in like, strictly speaking, this should be an, a, a test for equality, which is, you know, two equal sign, not just one equal sign. However, in C, it's actually technically syntactically correct for reasons that you're not, you know, nobody's quite sure to actually put an assignment statement inside of an if statement. Um, so this is actually valid syntax, but it's recognized as being probably not what you want. So rather than actually halt execution on an error like this, uh, GCC will actually spit out a warning instead. So oops, ls, there we go. GCC hello.c. There we go. At least it will once I've fixed any outstanding syntax errors. So you have to fix your errors first, but you know. If you turn on all the warnings, so W all, there you go. Uh, so it doesn't even show you the warning by default. You have to ask for it. Um, Suggest parentheses around assignment using a, used as truth value. So there you go. And even even then, the warnings can be a little uh, esoteric. So yeah, it'll warn you about things like uh, data types and pointer, pointers being used incorrectly, not using variables that have been declared, or again, the one that I just showed you. Uh, generally speaking, um, you should pay attention to your warnings. Um, some people are like, well, if it's not going to stop compilation, then I'm just going to continue and execute my program anyway. Gosh darn be the... Uh, 2QA4, that's Dynamics, isn't it? Um, and I didn't make the uh, the terminal transparent like that. It's, um, it's Gwake. It's... Uh, special program maps the terminal up down to like a button on my keyboard so it's you know it's cool anyway so yeah warnings when you're when you the student are writing c programs you should be aiming for zero warnings each warning is important um it is totally possible and to write c programs with no warnings all right so you should consider warnings to be important in C. Sometimes warnings aren't important. In this, they are important. So, in a Linux-like environment, an executable is run using the following command. Dot slash. This, uh, this causes two things to happen. Number one, you load the program into the RAM, or whatever your system's primary memory is. 
you know, if it's not RAM specifically, it's a RAM analog. And then it executes it. The CPU runs the program, starting with the first instruction and proceeding until the program terminates. In C, you start at the beginning of main and you end with uh, main's return function. In Python, main is implicit. It's like the entire the entire file is main. But in C, in order, like, the only thing that's going to be executed is the stuff that's in main. You can think of executing a C, C function, or you can ex think of executing a C program as directly invoking main. Calling main. So, um, this is uh, that idea in, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's dynamics. Um, yeah. So, when runtime isn't fun time. Often, your code will contain bugs, despite being compiled and linked successfully, especially when you're programming in a programming language like C that doesn't do a lot of stuff for you. These are known as semantic errors. Some semantic errors will just straight up crash your program. These are known as fatal errors. Uh, some examples of fatal, fatal errors in C are things like dividing by zero and trying to access memory that doesn't belong to you. This is the dreaded segfault. We are going to talk extensively about segfaults over the course of this class. Others uh, just cause a mismatch between the expected output of your program and its actual output. So it's important to know what the expected result of your program is for specific inputs. This is like... Um, you need to know the conditions under which your program is considered to be correct. Running a program with specific inputs and looking for a known correct output is known as testing. So, um, do all of your pro functions need to be nested inside main? No. Uh, main can call them, absolutely. You can define your functions, like in this space up here, and call them in main. Uh, C is a little bit tricky in that, like, it absolutely requires a function to be declared at least before it's used, so it can it, it can cause some interesting conditions. But yeah, you can write, you can define functions within main, but in general, we don't suggest it. Um, so. If you wish to interact with a C program using a monitor and keyboard, that is, you know, the way most of us interact with programs, that C program needs to interact with the following. Number one, standard input. Number two, standard output. Number three, standard error. So, these are the standard input output buffers that your computer uses in order to in for programs to interact with things. So standard input is the place that your computer logs keystrokes. Uh, so think of it this way. Inside of your computer, there is a certain amount of memory which has been set aside to record the keystrokes, right? So when I am typing away on my, com on my keyboard, those keystrokes are being logged in this buffer. Programs then go into this, they, they request from the operating system uh, you know, a certain number of characters from this bu buffer, right? So, um, this is what standard input is. When your, uh, when your Python program requests input, it's requesting it from standard input. When your, uh, when your C program, uh, it, by the way, in C, that's scanf. Um, when you printf things, you are putting characters into standard output. Standard output is then routed to whatever window it is that you have your terminal running in, if you're running X server, uh, in Linux anyway. Um, but yes. So, standard output, standard input, very, very important. We won't get into as much of this kind of stuff as possibly we should, but we're going to get into a little bit of it later on in the course. Um, standard error is similar to standard output, but it is reserved specifically for error messages, so that error messages don't get uh, corrupted by corruptions to standard output, for example. All three of these streams are emulated, 
or are connected in a more complex manner in environments such as Jupyter and VS Code. So when you run something in VS Code, it's emulating standard input for you. But yeah. So let's see. So int means integer. Yeah, so uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll very briefly, this is the anatomy of, of uh, the main function. Int is the return type of main. That's constrained by the program. It can't be anything other than int. Um, yes, of course that's the Brave browser. Of course I use Brave. It's the best browser. Um, this class does not have participation marks. Um, this In this class, you will get marks from doing actual work. Um, we're going to get to scanf. Yes. Good. So, there you go. That's the end of topic one. I have this comic, which I will read because it's funny. Um, then to invoke, then you need to invoke the compiler and, what's a compiler? This is what's going on in chat right now. Well, in this case, a compiler translates source code into object code, which is then passed to a linker, which turns it into machine code. Wait, what's machine code? Machine code is the code that can be directly executed by the CPU of the, what's a CPU? The CPU is a microprocessor that, what's a microprocessor? 10 minutes later. So the positive charge attracts electrons from P-type silicon that separates the, what's an electron? 30 minutes later. So according to this theory, electroweak symmetry breaking occurs at about 100 GeV. What's a GeV? You know. Yes. <clears throat> um, so, there you go. Very briefly, scanf is the analog to printf that receives input from standard input rather, that, rather than putting characters to standard output. There you go. Does true plus true equal two in C? Yes, I'm pretty sure it does. Um, so there we go. That's topic two. That's topic one taken care of. Let's move on to topic three. Uh, interestingly enough, so <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so Unix and version control. <clears throat> so this has a lot of small sections in it, but hopefully by the end of it, you'll know some bits and pieces enough to get started with Git and understand why it's good and why you should know how to use it. Um, so <clears throat> as mechatronics people, you are required to wear a lot of hats. And one of those hats is going to be software developer. You have picked a, uh, shall we say, the degree program that you have picked is not going to be easy because a, a lot of, like, once you get out into the real world, you're going to have to pick stuff up real quick because, uh, you know, it's impossible for you to be three things at once and have only a four-year degree program. Um, so, what, so... Part of me giving you, like, teaching you how to program C is also me teaching you how to be a software developer, at least in some respect. So these are some soft... We're going to talk about some software development skills that are, like, super, super useful, super, super important, uh, but have nothing to do with mechanics. So... <laughs> um, but the types of techniques that we're talking about in this, uh, in this lecture are useful across the board. Like, knowing how version control works is extremely useful, even if all you're doing is, you know, if all you're doing is applying, you know, version control to CAD documents, that's still a very useful thing to know how to do. So anyway, so let's talk about computers. It all started in the 1950s. In the beginning, Computers were very large, requiring large rooms for their housing. This is a picture of Leo, England's first commercially available computer from 1951. 
Uh, it's kind of interesting. Notice all of these floor panels, which you would lift up to see the cables that were running between the consoles and the computer itself. Like, the room is the computer. It's not just that there was a... that the, that the, uh, the computer required a room for storage. It was the computer was built into the room in the same way that you would build a kitchen into a house. Semiconductor electronics for the win. The semiconductor transistor, which was invented in the late 40s, is possibly the most important invention of the 20th century. I will fight you on this. The exponential growth of the number of transistors per unit o area over time meant that by the mid-1970s, the home or personal microcomputer became began outpacing the mainframe in terms of computational power. So these mainframes, yeah, you could buy one of these in 1951, but you would pro you would have to have uh, like the, as much money as an institution. So in the 50s, this is what a, a transistor looked like. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, right? So we start off at, so you can see the exponential growth here, right? By the time we hit the 2010s, which is the last, you know, one I could find data for, um, we're hitting in the order of 8 billion transistors in the same space that in the 50s you would have one, right? So these mainframes were very, um, they were very powerful for their time, but they were large and they were expensive. So, you know, by the time the 80s comes around, you can build a computer that is the equivalent, uh, you can build a computer that's like, can fit on your desk that has the equivalent power of a mainframe from like uh, 10 or 20 years ago, which just completely revolutionized everything. In fact, it caused the wild west of computing. Around this time, that is to say, um, around the uh, mid-70s, there was an explosion in computer manufacturing. Uh, different vendors uh, had very different processor architectures, though. This was kind of uh, just a little bit before everything coalesced around Intel and AMD as being the only people who could possibly make processors. Um, there were lots of different companies all competing in this space to make the best processor. Um, so, programs written at this time, most notably using languages such as Fortran, COBOL, and Lisp, uh, were not generally portable between machine architectures. A lack of strong standardization meant that many vendors included language extensions that were incompatible with other vendors' machines. So, if you were writing a COBOL program for this computer, and you tried to move it over to that computer, um, the you wouldn't be able to. You couldn't just pop a disk in, write the program to the disk, pull out your floppy disk, put it into the next computer, and then that com expect that program to work. It wouldn't work because computer A had a different implementation of COBOL or Fortran than, the, than number two. Um, oh, is this a different... Hmm. Interesting. I uh, somebody in the chat is claiming that the uh, the version on Ave Avenue is different from this version. Let me rectify that very quickly. I can I can fix that almost almost instantaneously. Just give me two seconds. I don't know how that happened, but uh, we shall. Hoop. Let's see here. All right, re-upload complete. If you download it, um, if you download it, then uh, uh, if you re-download it, you'll get it. <laughs> People in the 1900s who use pre-builds. Can you really, like, are we really now referring to it as the 1900s? Because, like, oh my god, I'm, I'm a person who was born in the 1900s, and that's kind of scary. But anyway, so, um, so this was a problem. The whole lack of standardization thing was a big problem. This changed uh, with the development of C in 1972 by Dennis Ritchie's at Bell Laboratory. Because C was strongly standardized, C programs could be ported across par uh, participating computer architectures with no compatibility issues. 
C was originally developed for writing utilities for the Unix operating system. So, Unix, the Uniplexed Information and Computing Service, which, you know, CS was uh, made into an X. Uniplexed Information and Computing Service. Unix was originally written in assembly code, but after the development of C, the Bell Labs gang re-implemented the Unix kernel in C, and it has remained in C ever since. Due to its low cost and high portability, especially to low cost hardware, Unix was widely adopted by academics institutions and from there the world. Um, Unix featured some key innovations. So think about how ubiquitous these things are in computing. Try to imagine a computer that doesn't have these features. One, a, hier a hierarchical file system with arbitrarily nested subdirectories. Files and folders. That was a Unix invention. The universalization of almost all file formats as new line delimited plain text. This is less the case in, in Windows for whatever reason. But uh, in, in Linux, pretty much, like, unless a file isn't executable, you'll find it is new line delimited play te plain text. Um, and three, a pervasive philosophy of modularity and code reuse, and the establishment of a set of cultural norms for software development practice. Mm-hmm. My god. So, this is the Unix family. We're not going to dwell on this, like, super long, but, um, basically, this is Unix. Unix eventually splits, um, uh, in a number of different versions. You have such interesting things as BSD, which uh, maintains uh, things to this day in the form of free BSD. Notice that um, uh, sort of the Mac OS, uh, Mac operating system that everybody likes is a derivation of BSD and NetBSD. Linux is kind of a, a slight, it's, it's not exactly a Unix like, it's Unix-based, but it's not a direct Unix derivation. But, you know, um, and you'll notice that nowhere on this does there appear to be Microsoft. It didn't update for you, eh? Um, so, oh, the operating systems, I, okay. Uh-oh. What? My, where, where are my pictures? Oh, no. Crap. <sighs> All right. Where did you go? Sorry, guys. Just give me a second here. For some reason, the, uh, crap. Where is it? Oh, that's weird. Hmm, I must have made modifications to this. All right. Well, interesting. Apparently, I cut the first section. Oh, boy. Sorry about that. It's been a hectic beginning of semester. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. There. Sorry about that. All right. Good God. So... Uh, yeah, that's known as LaTeX. Um, yeah, I guess I, I cut the history section because it was like there was a not a small amount of overlap with the um, with the slides like slide set one. But you know, well, you got bonus content. We'll just put it that way. So, operating systems then. Uh, to choose an OS, do you fear technology? Yes. Is your daddy rich? 
Yes, then you have Apple. If not, you have Chrome. If you do not fear technology, do you care about freedom or privacy? No, then you get Windows. Yes, uh, do you have a life? If you do not, Arch or Gen 2 or one of those distributions. If you do have a life, Ubuntu, Debian, or Fedora, or Mint. I also like Mint. So I did that slide. Here we go. <clears throat> An operating system provides a collection of services to user applications, allowing them to run a, on a computer's system's hardware. The user applications are anything from internet browsers to word processors to solitaire. The API, or Application Programming Interface, uh, provides system libraries and other utilities via system calls. These are typically executed by the kernel. So, this is how your computer works. You are the user. You start an application program. The application program uh, operates inside of the application programming interface. This is the shell layer. Underneath the shell layer, you have the kernel layer. Inside of the kernel, you have the device drivers. And inside of the device drivers, you have the hardware itself. Hmm. So. Operating systems include a kernel. The kernel manages access to memory that is your file system and your um, your RAM, access to the CPU, input and output handling, and access to hardware and software services. Most operating systems use kernels written in C because C is fast. The kernel is like of all of the func like of all of the code in your computer, the kernel is the stuff that's executed the most with the most frequency. So optimizations in the kernel make your whole operating system faster. That's why the kernel is often written in a low level language like C. So there you go. So let's talk about Linux. Linux is a family of free operating systems. Linux, uh, Unix was free until 1984 when AT&T divested itself of Bell Labs. Unix then became proprietary software. This led to the creation of the GNU project and the GNU general public license in 1989, which kicked off the open source movement. So, if uh, AT and T, or it, like if AT and T hadn't have got greedy, then the open source movement as we know it probably wouldn't have existed, at least not in the current form. Um, the Linux kernel was written in 1991 by Linus Torvalds at the University of Helsinki. Today, Linux has the largest install base of any operating system, though only about 2% of personal computers run it. And just as a fun, uh, just as a fun exercise uh, for the chat, try to figure that one out. How is it that Linux has the largest install base of any operating system, uh, even though only about 2% of computers use it? <laughs> Giving it a bash. In Linux distributions, command line interfaces are still commonly used. Command lines have higher skill caps than GUIs. That's the basic reason. So if you're using Linux, you are a computer power user. Um, if you know how to if you know how to use a command line interface, then you know how to script a command line interface. And if you know how to script a command line interface, you can automate many, many, many of the routine or boring computer tasks that you would perform. Um, servers, 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 yes, yes, yes. But there's another reason. Um, so, the bash shell, yes, that's it, Android. Android is like the big one. Uh, most computer systems are running Android these days. <clears throat> and Android is Linux-based. All the penguins run on Linux. Ha! So, the bash shell is the most common command line interface in Unix-like environments. So this is how you can get it. In Windows, the L Windows subsystem for Linux, which a number of people have um, uh, mentioned already, uh, allows Windows 10 users and above to access the bash prompt. Uh, skill cap makes it sound like a video game. It is. It is like a video game. 
uh, on Macintoshes. If you open up a terminal and enter the command bash, then that will bring you to a bash prompt, which means that all of the commands that I'm about to talk about work. In Linux, do you even have to ask? The best and most convenient way to do this course is with a bash prompt, in my opinion. But, you know, your mileage may vary. Accessing Linux from older Windows computers. Uh, we have set up a server for you to log into if the <clears throat> if the options on the previous slide don't work for some reason. Like if you're uh, stuck in uh, Windows 7 Purgatory, for example, or uh, Windows Vista Purgatory. Remote servers can be accessed using a thing called Secure Shell Protocol, or SSH. On Windows, it is common to use a secure shell client, such as PuTTY. You can download PuTTY from this link here. Uh, what programming language has the highest skill ceiling? Um, that, that is a question for the ages. Um, um, I think Haskell has a pretty high skill ceiling. <clears throat> The department has set up the server for the class to use this semester. For more information on how to access it, check the resources section on the course content on Avenue. Always remember to log out when you're finished. I can't do it now because it requires the VPN. Um, the VPN, I can't run the VPN and stream at the same time, so I can't give you a demonstration. But um, ask, your, ask your TA in tutorial and uh, they'll be able to do it for you. Um, let me just put something in my book for a moment. Just thought of bug Derek about Pascal server. Got to make sure it's operational. I've never heard of cow. So. Almost all Unix and Unix-like systems support a comprehensive set of bash commands. Um, so if you uh, follow this link, you'll find the list of Unix commands. There are a lot of commands, and there are all, like, if you learn how to use commands properly, you can, like, you can be extremely powerful. Um, the output of one command can be made the input of another command using pipes and filters. Um, bash commands can be collected into scripts and executed as units. Uh, bash commands can be invoked from a program written in C or Python. You can do things like do find and replace op operations over every file in your operating system. Uh, it's extremely powerful stuff, but you have to know what you're doing. So, so let's talk about the Linux di uh, directory structure. The directory structure in Linux is hierarchical in the same way that it is for Windows. Directories may contain files and subdirectories forming a tree. In bash, commands are executed within the working or active directory. One directory in your file system is designated as active. This active directory may be changed using the cd command. So this is like oops, uh, a good way to think of it is like this is the directory that you're in. So. Here are some uh, here are some basic bash commands. Uh, maybe I'll do it in a in a big window so you guys can see better. Boop. Um, control plus plus. No. View. Zoom in. There we go. All right. So here we go. So I used a couple already. LS lists the contents of a directory. LS-LA displays the contents of a directory, including read and write permissions, date of last modification, and includes hidden files and folders. <coughs> change directory, CD, allows you to change to a different directory. So for example, topic three, there you go. Generally speaking, you. Linux directories don't like spaces. Um, so if you want to go up a directory, it's cd dot dot, and that goes up a directory. Um, 
And that's enough for now, I think. That's how to navigate the directory structure. Questions? Hmm. Insert unlimited power meme. Is git bash good for what we need in this course, or do we need Windows subsystem for Linux? Um, I've never used git bash. I'm not sure if it's good enough or not. Um, but you know, if you can, if you have all of, if if you can run GCC in it, then you're probably fine. What is the relation between bad bash commands and coding in C? Um, this is how you invoke your compiler, right? So in order to compile in like the type of environment that C was designed for, which is you know Unix slash Linux slash you know this type stuff. The command that compiles a C program is GCC, right? Um, it's like compiling by command line is primary. It's a primary skill, right? Um, anything with respect to, like, anything with respect to, sorry, there's just this guy who's like, Okay. All right. It's nothing nothing big, just some guy taking a picture of my property. All right. Weird. Anyway, <clears throat> so if you were taught to use git bash in tutorial, then that, you know, there, there you go, then it's good enough. Um, so yeah, it's like... Programming in C is not just knowing the language itself, right? Programming in C is also knowing the environment in which you program C. Um, so this is what I'm trying to teach you, right? Um... For the terminal in VS Code, is it okay to use git bash instead of PowerShell? Yes, I would recommend it. So, anyway. Um, yeah, so, essentially, so, let me, um, let me digress briefly about how I'm, how I've chosen to run this course a little bit. Uh, so, in previous offering... Uh, in a previous offering of this um, of this course, the one that I ran last year, um, like the last the last little bit of the course was taken and given over to learning some very rudimentary C++. Turns out that that's not actually um, that's not actually like a requirement. So I decided to try to give you something a little more useful this time around. So. We're going to we're going to focus a little bit more on the Linux stuff because these are extremely useful skills that you will find extremely useful, um, you know, later on in your uh, later on in your degree. You know, particularly if you decide to go on with the computer stuff. So yes, so we're going to learn some Linux in this class. So yes, good. Here are some actual bash commands. So. Um, Cat displays the uh, contents of a file. So if I've got, um, mm, let me just topic one dash introduction cat um, topic one introduction dot text, which is the source file. I can just view the file with cat. There you go. Um, CD, I showed you already. CP copies a file. Copy from this place to that place. LS lists directory contents. Man command shows the command's man page, which stands for manual. So, for example, man GCC. GCC, GNU compiler collection. So, the Linux philosophy in general is read the manual. So, you have to read the manual. Uh, yes. PS lists all processes. Make dear uh, creates a directory, creates a new directory. PWD outputs the current working directory. RM removes a file. RM dear removes a directory if it's empty. And grep searches file contents. 
So for example, if you want to uh, if you want to find um, grep R A um, C. These are all in all instances of the occurrence of the letter C, but I should probably say something like C space or space C space. There you go. So you can see all of the places in like all of these files where um, C uh, with a C space before and after it have occurred, and that's useful. How do you move a file into a different directory? It's very simple. MV for move. So, so SSH, Secure Shell Protocol. So from a command line, you use SSH, just SSH, then, or SSH, then you have your username at um, servername.com, right? Kind of like an email address. You'll, you then make be, uh, you'll probably be po uh, prompted for a password. So, Yes. Basically, it looks like I'm trying to invoke an elf. <laughs> oh man, yes. Well, that's th see, that's what you get when you try to view a binary file, right? So, like, image files are binary files. So, if I cat um, Moore's law, it's just a bunch of random gunk, right? But if you uh, if you view it as an image, then it actually makes sense. But you'll notice that there's a few, like there's a few bits at the end that are actually stored in plain text, like the date of creation. So some of the metadata is stored in plain text within this binary file. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> so when you open up a SSH connection, all that is is another bash prompt, right? But the bash prompt is important. Uh, because it's running on a different computer, right? So basically, you've logged in, you've opened up another session on a different computer, and that um, <clears throat> that makes it uh, <clears throat> it's it's like you're the client, that's the server, right? You can send things directly to the um, to the server. You can execute commands on the server remotely. It's kind of like remote de desktop, except without the desktop. Um, I noticed so that sometimes on com some commands you use a dash. Yes. So the dash is a flag. Very good question. So you specify options uh, on a um, you specify options on a command using dash and then some letters. So if I type man ls, all of these guys. These are all of the options you can use. So for example, if you do something like it's usually V, oh, okay, maybe not. But um, with LS, if you use L, that lists all of the permissions and the, the times modified and the, the file sizes. If you use A, that shows hidden files. Normally in Unix, anything that has a dot in front of it is a hidden file. So uh, L and A is just uh, dash L A. In grep, R is recursive, and I forget what A does, but it makes it work, so that's why I use it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a network protocol is an agreed upon format for information transmission. Anything but military-grade intranets should be considered insecure, and even then. In short, you, the client, open up a shell on the remote server. This is the way that PuTTY accesses your server. Uh, it just gives you a nice little GUI for entering the connection details. So, this is what PuTTY's uh, command... This is what PuTTY looks like, right? And uh, these... Um, Nice, it's like when you try to install something on Python and it suggests you upgrade to get the newest version. Yes! There you go. Um, yeah, see? This is important and useful information I'm giving you, you know? <laughs> so, uh, if you decide to use PuTTY, uh, basically, um, it just asks for all of the information that you would be required to provide 
via the command line, it just asks for it in the form of like a, uh, a window, right? So like you enter your host name, you enter what your username is somewhere and etc. etc. So the point of this course is for you to gain computer skills. The most important computer skill is knowing when and how to look things up. When in doubt, consult the documentation. So let's talk about um, coding as a team. Shifting things slightly. Man, we're running out of time. So in real life, code can change a lot over the, pro pro over the lifespan of a project. If managing your own code is a royal pain in the keister, which it totally is, you all know it, imagine a project with hundreds of developers working on it. This actually happens. Imagine, you know, imagine what Red Dead Redemption 2, what its code base looks like. Um, putty can be used to access a, a bash interface. One approach might be to have different developers work on separate areas of the code. This is known as divide and conquer. conquer. In practice, however, uh, this is pretty common. Uh, one developer will work on one component, like a library file in C or something, and uh, the next developer will work on something else. Everybody will have a certain degree of code ownership. This also provides some degree of accountability if somebody's code goes wrong, uh, right? <clears throat> so... Pros. Developers don't make changes to app overlapping areas of code most of the time. Uh, and developers build expertise with their area of the code and can make changes uh, and updates faster most of the time. The problem, of course, is that A. Coding projects don't always break down that easily. B. We are trusting people, and trusting people is always dangerous. And three. At a certain point, the various components need to be integrated. Um, you know, you can get a certain ways yet with modularizing your code, right? Modularization is extremely powerful and important, but sooner or later, all of those modules have to come together into some kind of final product. Thus, the problem of multiple developers working on the same code is unavoidable for large projects. In addition, there is the bus factor to consider. The bus factor is a measurement of the risk resulting from information and capabilities not shared among team members dividing, derived from the phrase, in case they get hit by a bus. So, if only one person knows how to work with this very, very crucial element of the code, uh, and they get hit by a bus, does your project end? Uh, hopefully not. We don't like that people... We don't want people to get hit by buses, but, uh, you know, if they do, we should have contingencies in place. Modern problems require modern solutions, which we're going to talk about next time in class, because we're out of time. Are there any questions? If you're the only one who knows how it works, they can't fire you. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. A good, like, good memes never die. Good memes never die. Um. Also, old is not really a concept that makes any sense to apply to a, to a meme, because, like... If a if a meme is a is a week old, then it's old. Like if you can apply, if you can say, you know, this this meme first appeared like n days ago, and n is greater than two, then it's an old meme. So there you go. Is there a way you can fry your computer from the command line? Um, no, it's built into the hardware. I'm afraid. The uh, 
if you try to overheat your computer, there's an actual hardware uh, switch that will prov that will shut your computer off before it before it engages in destructive overheating. <laughs> Could I go over how Bash and programming and C are, in C are related? Uh, are, uh, so, yeah, run crisis from the command line. Um, <clears throat> so, so the Bash interface is a feature of the Unix and Linux operating systems, right? Unix and Linux are integrally related to C, both the historical development of C and like most C development that's real C development. It's happening on Linux, right? So, you know, I, I kind of made a joke uh, like a couple of classes ago that, um, you know, the Linux is the CIDE. And, like, I actually believe that to be the case. Um, but, yeah. Um, are you going, are we going to be learning more about scripts? Yes, uh, uh, one of the tutorials coming up has bash scripting, like a rough intro to bash scripting in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um yeah. So, although if you want to if you want to like I that was talking about um that was talking about uh frying your computer in a literal like a thermal sense. If you want to fry your computer in terms of just, you know, uh completely obliterate your uh your so your operating system and everybody everything in it, just navigate up to your root directory and type sudo rm star and that'll delete your entire operating system uh so yeah <laughs> so sorry sudo rm dash r star uh yeah so it is definitely possible to completely destroy yourself um so are you going to be tested are we going to be tested on this um yeah, possibly. I've done multiple choice in this class before, so um, we may have some multiple choice. Um, I tend not to make the multiple choice, you know. Multiple choice tends to still be application problems. Like, with when you run your tests as... Um, when you run your tests as a, a take-home, you can't just do a, like a multiple choice that's like, you know, regurgitate X from the slides, because, like, everybody has the slides, right? So, you know, are these slides just for your knowledge, or are they going to be tested? Um, uh, I'll try not to be annoyed by all of the people who are saying, is this on the test? Is this on the test? Is this on the test? It's like, you have to judge for yourself whether this information is suitably interesting or worthy of your brain space, you know? It's like, yes, by understanding this stuff, you will be a better programmer. Being a better programmer will mean that you do the test better. So, you know, whether or not you want to level up your skills, that's up to you. I, um, you know, you guys are bigger, big enough and ugly enough to decide whether or not you need to pay attention in class. I have occasionally done, uh, multiple choice knowledge type questions in this class though most of the most of the test will be uh, actual C programming though slash assembly once we get to the exam <clears throat> hmm. Okay, I think that's everything for today, so I'll be uh, I'll be signing off here. Take her easy, folks. <laughs>